Um, Manish is a VP of Marketing and Operations in the Broadcom's Optical Systems Division. Um, he leads go-to-market and operational activity for the division responsible for developing and manufacturing devices and systems used in optical communications. And prior to Broadcom, uh, Manish was EVP and product line management of Source Photonics, where he led the company's entry into the data center market. And Manish holds a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a BS in electrical engineering from the University of Texas. Manish, thanks very much. And your talk is going to be titled Scaling Highly Integrated Optical Interconnects. Hello. Uh, hi, Rob. How are you doing? OK, I just realized as I was trying to share, I'm having to pry permission. So I'll be on and I will be able to share right here. There we go. All right. Your screen. Thanks very much. OK, great. So thank you, Rob, for the introduction. And um, appreciate everyone's time this afternoon. As I was hearing the last few talks, you know, this morning and, and just now, I was actually eliminating slides, uh, as as a lot of it was was covered. But um, as I, I go through the material, and I'll certainly present some of what Broadcom is doing in the integrated optics and CPO space. Um, but um, I also encourage everyone, as we go towards the end of the talk, to really look at it from a lens of, um, you know, while we've invested early on for the networking applications and some of the more obvious, uh, in order to hit some of the more obvious benefits that CPO was targeting in high density networking, are we actually developing a platform at the device level that is um, scalable into many of the, to solve many of the problems that were mentioned earlier uh, today? So, you know, just reiterating one, one critical point, um, you know, I think we started uh, a lot of investments in co-packaged optics in the networking space in order to both reduce costs and reduce power for those high density interconnects, but as scale out and, and scale up has, has gained traction due to the, you know, 80% of spend in the data center that is applied to memory and, and processing and maximizing use of those resources. Um, it, it is important for all of us who are investing in the optical interconnect technology to reflect on whether the developments and the investments that we're making are going to apply to uh, improving the problems that we expect to be introduced um, <clears throat> in the next phases of, of uh, whether it's disaggregation or higher bandwidth. And, and I think we'll hear a lot more content on how device technology can um, can uh, improve that uh, and improve the efficiencies using coherent and other means. Um, but I wanted to, you know, just start with one, I guess, analysis of a limit that we do see uh, emerging. So here on the bottom left, we see how, you know, an electrical signal degrades once it leaves an ASIC die and travels to an endpoint. And, um, you, you know, as the line rate increases from 50 gig today, which is widely deployed, to 100 gig, um, which is on the horizon, and 200 gig just a few years away, losses through a standard system are increasing from under 10 dB at um, 50 gig to over 20 dB once you get to the 200 gig. And you know, we did an analysis on how that um, impacts, say, a board design with 512 lanes, um, for example, for a, a high density switch. And, and what we found was that as you get to the 200 gig per lane, the board level complexity has increased to where almost all of the board traces have a length that will exceed the loss budget to achieve even one meter of DAC cable transmission out of the box. Um, and, and I think this goes to you know, some of uh, Rob's on his table when you're looking at the, the shelf versus the rack in the row, um, where we're really gonna have to think about transitioning to optical in whatever form that it is to, uh, to overcome these losses. And there, there are investments in, in areas like fiber cables that are certainly gonna get adoption, um, but to truly scale, you know, the, the, true, the right way to, to overcome this is to take optical directly out of the ASIC package. And, and these ASICs, which are gonna require tens of terabits of diet bandwidth, um, you know, there are ways of achieving that uh, through, through highly integrated optics and, and co-packaging. So, um, you know, here's today's conventional optical transceivers. You can see on the left, for example, like a DR4 module that, that um, we've designed in our division. And then we've also 
um, developed a, a fully integrated module. So these are both, um, you know, effectively 800 gig gigabit per second modules, single mode transmission. But on the right, it's uh, the left is uh, built using traditional optics, right? Discrete optical components. And on the right, uh, you have basically silicon photonic shiplets in package. And in this case, what that means is you have your uh, photonic integrated circuit and your electrical integrated circuit that are die stacked. So two separate ICs die stacked together and then planarly mounted on a uh, common substrate. And in this case, we can achieve 30% um, fewer piece parts. So that is a um, very nice improvement. You know, your less material usage, uh, definitely lower power uh, consumption is, is capable in this mode. But you're still going to take for 64 of these in order to get full bandwidth out of a uh, full optical bandwidth out of a, a 51T switch. So um, if you take a look at you know, a co-packaged optic, you uh, now have the opportunity to condense those 64 components potentially down to you know, 4, 8, or 16 optical engines. You can reduce the number of fiber connectors uh, by 75%. You can uh, reduce the number of, of critical dyes um, by about 75%. And, um, and here's an example of what that looks like in the system. You can take, uh, you know, you've now taken all of those, those Pueblo modules and you've really condensed it down to what you see on this uh, inside the, the red outline uh, below. And uh, that that you know that is the first phase of efficiency improvement that um, I think the industry has been investing in uh, with co-packaged optics. So this is an example of you know one of the products that we're we're developing. So you have a uh, core ASIC. Uh, in this case, it's an Ethernet switch, and you have four 3.2 terabit optical engines um, that uh, get all of your 12.8 terabit of electrical connectivity. Um, that's required for, for this particular uh, configuration. Um, so you've now reduced what would have been, say, 16 um, optical transceivers down to four optical engines. Uh, you can use integrated laser sources. You know, what I think one of, uh, one of the other talks coming up will certainly uh, speak to that. Or if you go with remote laser sources in order to disaggregate that um, the power generation of the laser and, and you know, get some replaceability in order to manage the reliability characteristics of the system, um, you still get a pretty significant reduction in the amount of material and power you need to use in order to drive, um, you know, in order to drive this uh, drive this system. So, um, you know, what facilitates that there are um, th there's a reason that the there there's an opportunity to begin to take this to manufacturing and to scale. And it's because there has been, um, you know, in the top here, you see cartoon of HBM integration with ASICs. And that's been talked a lot about, I think over the last several talks, this is now um, in high volume and those packaging technologies uh, such as silicon interposers and, and uh, TSVs are, are deploying now, I think about 27% year over year growth rate in, uh, in the market deployments of those technologies. It's the same tools and processes and materials that can be used by photonic solutions developers to develop new innovative products. So um, by using pitch matching, basically taking these silicon, uh, silicon photonics engines and pitch matching to a core ASIC, you can maximize the, um, uh, the RF, uh, basically you can uh, use optimal RF performance materials and you can get the, the most optimal signal integrity due to the application of these uh, packaging technologies um, that have gotten pretty widespread usage uh, within data centers. And you know, here's a cross-sectional SEM of the outcome. So as I mentioned, you have a photonic integrated circuit, which is going to have your MZMs or ring modulators, photodiodes, and waveguides, die stacked, die stacked in this case with like an electrical IC, um, which has modulator drivers and TIAs. And then that stack is on a common substrate uh, with a signal processor. 
And you can tell here, even just from uh, the, the dimensioning, that the very short physical spacing of that die stack and the signal processor uh, does facilitate you know, optimal signal integrity characteristics. Um, so, so to not only develop, but, but scale these solutions in the coming year, you know, th there is a rethinking of device and packaging architecture that is required. Um, you know, some of the areas that we've had to invest and in that the, the industry is going to have to continue to invest and develop are, are listed here. You know, the, there's a lot of work obviously done regularly on the core ASICs, whether it's networking um, or compute ASICs. Um, but, you know, some of the other areas that we've had to innovate with partners um, on laser devices, you know, we have to transition to very high power continuous wave lasers that uh, can operate fully uncooled in order to, uh, you know, minimize reliability risk, minimize the, um, and minimize the, um, the, the power consumption of those devices. In silicon photonics, uh, we're having to invest in device architectures that allow you to ensure you can physically integrate the electrical ICs and the photonic ICs. Um, you know, we, we've been looking at this in, in multiple material systems, including silicon germanium, but ultimately, you certainly would like this to be in CMOS in order to drive the um, you know, lowest power consumption for the speeds at which uh, we're developing uh, the products for. And, and, then, um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the, the advanced packaging and test is um, absolutely critical in order to be able to ensure that you can use those techniques to, to co-package the ASICs and the optical interconnects. And then, um, so, so here's an example that, uh, an analysis that shows the benefits of any level of integration, uh, both for uh, bandwidth escape density as well as for power efficiency. So on the left, left curve, what we've done is we've calculated the improvement in, in both the physical and power efficiency um, for um, placing the optics in various spacing through various packaging techniques away uh, from the ASIC. So architecting solutions with socketed onboard optics um, you know, that are either on the PCB or they're near packaged optics, say on a substrate, do provide meaningful power savings. You know, you can start to see optical interconnect powers that are below 20 picojoules per bit. Um, now, your, your escape density is still going to be limited to the electrical socket pitch. Um, that's not a constraint in many of today's um, applications, but based on the applications where you're trying to get, say, um, you know, terabytes uh, per die edge of a, of a core compute ASIC, that start, does start to become um, a limitation. As soon as you solder that chiplet to a common substrate uh, with an ASIC, your physical bandwidth limit transitions from the socket electrical fiber pit, uh, socket electrical uh, pitch to the fiber pitch. And you can start to derive your you know, exponential escape density by growing in, in the WDM domain. You know, realistically, uh, in, in the next several generations with four or eight channels, especially if you're using for uh, like mox ender modulators. Um, so on the right, we've translated that into optical internet connect power for 400 gig, 800 gig, and 1.6 terabit bandwidth comparing pluggables and CPO. And you can see the benefits on the right. The pluggables are going to continue to improve. Um, DSPs will move and signal processing will move from 7 nanometer, 5 nanometer, and 3 nanometer. CMOS TIAs are already available on the market. But the, the fundamental need to perform the signal processing at the optical module will remain a limitation. Um, so if you compare these two, you know, integration options, uh, on the left, you have the socketed versions, you know, the primary benefit and why this is certainly going to derive adoption in, in, in the next, um, in the early stages of integration is because it does provide flexibility, it is reconfigurable, um, and, and it does provide a multi vendor eco, um, you know, a lot more multi vendor options at the socket level, uh, but then the silicon photonic chiplets in package. Um, do provide the long-term platform benefit of that of truly leveraging uh, semiconductor packaging capabilities in order to maximize your uh, power efficiency and your bandwidth density. There is another benefit here that we do need to look at as we really look into uh, true compute optical interconnect, which is that if you do want to migrate to wide and parallel interfaces, at the optical um, at the um, optical engine, 
you would need to um, really have uh, soldered chiplets. So, um, you know, no one's doing this alone. There's a lot of partners involved. And I wanted to note some of the, the vectors of innovation and what can be done here, where we'd really like to see, um, you know, a lot, a lot of universities, academia, industry continue to invest. Certainly in connectivity, as soon as you solder a chiplet, you can no longer have a uh, fiber, a fixed fiber, epoxy fiber. So uh, you do need detachable connectors. Um, in terms of devices, there's always going to be ongoing improvement in, in line rates. Uh, but there's still a lot of opportunity in packaging to ultimately get to that 100 to 1,000 X improvement in true optical bandwidth density. I spoke today about what you can achieve with just substrate level co-packaging where you know we can get to about you know 6.4 to 12.8 terabits so you know divide by eight obviously for your terabyte of diage bandwidth but as you go then to interposers uh you know silicon interposers used for say hbm and ultimately potentially using micro tsvs you can get that additional order of magnitude versus what we're even trying to develop today um, again all using very you know emerging and, and maturing uh, semiconductor technologies um you know so I think finally, uh, you know, these are some numbers on what's achievable now with um, platforms that Broadcom is developing and, and that many of our peers are developing optical interconnect power of less than six watts per 800 gig, 500 gig per uh, millimeter of diage bandwidth, um, being able to attach um, through detachable connector uh, technology 64 single mode fibers to that diage. Um, and, and I think these are all an important step forward. Um, and, you know, if we, if we continue to innovate down this uh, platform, uh, there's opportunities, I think, to really continue to, to drive uh, the next order of magnitude improvement, both on diage, uh, bandwidth, and, and power consumption. So. Great. Thank you very much, Manish. That's really, uh, really great. And uh, good visibility in some of the commercial investments and uh, demonstrations of how this technology is going to change going forward. Appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, I think we have time for one quick question. Uh, came from Ram. Um, his question is, um, how significant is CPO's benefit to switchboard development and material costs? Um, there's a lot of, uh, so, so there, there's pros and cons. You know, it is new for the industry. So if you're developing, if you're developing a switch box um, and you're a system developer, uh, you have to make, you've got to start putting some time into understanding fiber routing, strain relief, um, because we're not at the phase yet, you know, where we are transmitting these optical signals, say, through the board. Um, there's, there's a lot of new paradigms that are going to be needed on testability. So, you know, who owns the testability? At what level can you test so that you're not, you know, throwing away the, the system at the very last level? Um, but there's also a lot of elegance and simplicity on the board design once those ramp up uh, pains are worked through um, in terms of power delivery, in terms of the space that's available for additional components on the board, simply because you're opening up a lot of um, uh, real estate on the board by compressing those uh, engines to, to right next to the ASIC. So. Got it. Okay, great. Thanks again, Manish.